Hello everyone, Nick Green here of Behavior Fit. Um, today I'm going to take a, this is going to be part one of a two-part uh, podcast in which um, last Sunday I gave a performance call, or a performance, I call it, I'm reading the word performance, I gave a presentation called Unleash Performance Inside and Outside the Box, A Scientific Approach to Health Benefits and Gains. Now while there's many people interested, um, not everybody lives in Noblesville, Indiana, so not everybody could attend. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is go ahead and go through part one on the podcast. Again, this is a YouTube video, so I have the slides in the background. And then uh, next week I'll do part two. But uh, today we're going to handle part one, performance um, outside the box. So um, big shout out to Three Kings Athletics. Um, they gave me the platform, got to meet a lot of new members, um, had a great discussion, gave me new ideas for future presentations and, and coaching strategies in the future. So big big shout out to Three Kings Athletics. Go ahead and follow them everywhere. All right, again, uh, the disclaimer here for this uh, this presentation, this part one is, uh, you know, I love CrossFit. I, as a behavior analyst, uh, want to recommend uh, physical activities that uh, align with individual preferences and what is is possible in somebody's environment now there is a, a shaping step to crossfit you know it takes a while to learn things so i think there's benefits to everybody but again this is just <laughs> disclaimer i love it uh, maybe you might love it too um this uh this podcast this message this part one is just a supplement to what um is already out there you know when it comes to coaching and, and fitness and everything and um really it's all about you know everybody's journey is unique so um just let's let's just get those those pieces out of the way so my goal here um again looking at the slides um it's really to educate on the importance of movement outside of the box so we're spending a lot of time in the gym you know what happens outside of the box i keep saying box that's just kind of the lingo the street term for um what a crossfit gym is called uh, the box um so second goal provide tools and strategies for you to enhance your training inside the box. That'll be in next week's podcast. And then really just, you know, it's really to share my passion for fitness and science. Um, um, again, looking at uh, Behavior Fit as, a, as, a, as, a, as an education-based company and what I help people do, it really kind of comes down to this, is that it's all about making better fitness decisions. And if we break down each of those terms, better is I value database decision making, so I think my decisions will be better in that respect. Fitness, it's fitness is the subject matter, and decisions is, I bring that up because, you know, I can make all the decisions in the world, but really when it comes down to it, everything that I'm going to present on this podcast and all previous podcasts and future episodes, future content, it's all about what you're going to do, what decision you're going to make when you're given this information. So, uh, that's what it comes down to. Behavior Fit is about helping you make better fitness decisions. So a little bit about me um, on the slides here. I got a sports side and I have a nerd side. Sports side, I like to bring this up, talk about this at the beginning of any presentation because, um, it, again, your job as a consumer is to really evaluate. You know, am I qualified to talk about, you know, everything that I am about, you know, that I will share here in this episode and everywhere else. So. Uh, sports side um, when it comes to crossfit and functional fitness functional movements um, i've been in the game for about six years working on my seventh year Um, i've learned i've earned extra certificates when it comes to um, these coaching modalities so crossfit has a basic crossfit level one coaching certificate um, that is a an all weekend training you do a lot of in-person demonstrations learn a lot about um, the movements the foundational principles uh, things like that so I have that certificate, which that would allow me to coach in any CrossFit box if I if I chose that career path. Um, there's I also have a certificate in movement and mobility, in which uh, Kelly Starrett, he's also known as the Supple Leopard. Go ahead and check him out. Um, he's kind of the, uh, I would call him the godfather of movement and mobility. I'm really looking at taking care of yourself, I'm taking care of your joints, bodies, muscle, body, muscle, tendons, all those things to help you um, move and ambulate you know, all throughout your day at a high level um, so i have those two extra certificates when it comes to um, functional training and i also have a background uh, just general sports background i played baseball the most um, ever since uh, elementary school then i wrestled for six years ran cross country played golf and played a lot of soccer um, growing up so that's kind of the sports side nerd side now this is the fun part um, 
graduated in May of 2019 with my PhD in behavioral psychology. Um, so behavior analysis focusing on specifically sedentary behavior, sitting, looking at why movement is so important as it relates to activities in the workplace, and that's what a lot of this part one will be about. I got my master's degree in organiza organizational behavior management, which is the application of the science of human behavior to the workplace. So we're all humans, we're all doing things, we're all making errors, we're all doing fantastic things. Applying those principles to the workplace is really kind of my skill set and specialty. And then I have a general background in psychology. I went to Purdue. Boiler up. Um, just a warning here. I do have a lot of science ahead. And when it comes to science, you know, all of this, all of my talking points are derived from the latest scientific evidence related to health, fitness, and behavioral psychology, behavior analysis. So um, everything's always subject to change. But what I am going to present on this podcast is really the... Um, the latest information, the latest and greatest when it comes to uh, sitting, increasing performance outside of the outside of the gym. So, this is part one: unleashing performance outside of the box. So, when we begin talking about movement, we need to start with the evolution of movement. This is where I may lose some people, but we all, if we're all on the same page here, uh, we need to uh, see how our bodies, our human structure has been adapted to move so on the slides here we see this beautiful uh, rendition of our musculature uh, we have all bones muscles and tendons we have arches in our feet um, the arches help support you know the, the function of the foot our toes extend forward allow us to move in a forward direction our glutes the largest muscles in our bodies help us stabilize to stand upright our hips have evolved to face sideways to carry all that torso weight and our spine is shaped like a nice S-curve um, to help balance with our head, neck, moving forward. So um, starting there, we have a very good understanding that our, our body has, been, has evolved for general movement day in and day out. Um, and really when we look at the consequences of movement, it came down to this. It's all tied to the effort for food. So we have our ancestors moved or walked every day. Um, at, a, at a very high level. So um, these are anthrop anthropomorphic data. Or I believe that's right. Um, the historians have figured out that uh, our female ancestors walked 5.6 miles a day on average, and males 9.3 miles a day. Now what, what's the difference there? Well, males were out in the bush hunting and gathering, doing more long-distance hunting, things like that. So they racked up more miles on their frames. So that was how much activity our ancestors had back in the day. And now today, if we're thinking about the consequence related to food, that effort is really next to zero. And how do we know that? Well, we have grocery stores, right? The food is brought to a store, and we drive our car to the store, and we get out, and there's not much hunting or gathering. It's all right there with a nice price tag, and off we go. We have apps. Um, I'm in a office sitting now many people have the doordash app have the uber eats app have all these uh have all these food delivery apps um you know my favorite restaurant is jimmy john's they they pride themselves on being freaky fast so again the effort is really just a phone call or an app away and so we uh we're in trouble here right that's where we, that's where we're getting to so i have a graph here looking on the x-axis we have daily y-axis we have miles um, so again, looking at that ma that male daily mile output, males are walking and running nine miles a day. Females five to six, five point six miles a day, and really, we're not even meeting the the basic recommendations. And so, if if you think about um, what the current recommendations are, uh, there's common ones out there provided by um, you know CDC, General Health Organizations, uh, American Heart Association. Now think about it. What is the general recommendation today when it comes to physical activity? It is 10,000 steps per day, which is roughly five miles, and that is below the female average. So on the chart here, you have males at nine, nine miles per day, females at 5.6, and the general minimum recommendation is 10,000 steps per day. And we all know the world is not moving that at a minimum. So, well, what's the issue now? Now, the problem is we're living in this information age. Again, we're doing more things not tied to our survival. So 
these rapid changes in culture leave us with the same two to four million year old body, right? So um, we have a graph here that shows uh, from the 1400s up to about 1950, and there's orange dots along this blue curve, and you see just like in 1400, the printing press was invented. In the late 1800s, the car was invented. Then in the 1960s and 70s, you have uh, computers, and you have cell phones, and now today we have smartphones, and we have all these wonderful bits of technology, so the curve is going sharp, sharply up, so the growth is is uh, exponential on the technology curve. But now we have a red horizontal line just below that, and that shows the change of what? The human body. The human body has not changed um, to any degree or fashion to the extent that technology has changed. So we have a bit of a mismatch here, and that's something that um, comes from a lot of the evolutionary biologist books. Uh, the term is like a uh, a mismatch hypothesis, hypothesis, meaning that the world has a, around us has changed, but our bodies have not changed um, to keep up with it. Um, and so as a researcher, a lot of opportunity here. There's $117 billion um, worth of opportunity because that's the estimate that the CDC put out back in 2016 that the, the cost of physical inactivity each year exceeds $117 billion every single year. It really kind of comes down to this. I don't know how many people have heard of the phrase sitting versus smoking. Um, if you have, great. If not, this will be a, a key educational moment here for you. So sitting, I have a quote here. For every hour you sit watching TV or listening to a lecture, listening to this podcast in your car, your life expectancy decreases by 22 minutes. And that comes from a leading health researcher, David Dunstan. 22 minutes. Keep that in mind. Now, smoking... For every cigarette you smoke, your life expectancy decreases by 11 minutes. So here we have sitting decreasing by 22 minutes for every hour and smoking decreasing by 11 minutes. So I might ask, you know, you might think of, oh boy, if I sit and smoke, does that decrease by 33 minutes? Eh, I don't know if the math works out that way, but we can see um, just by that 22 to 11, you know, smoking one cigarette versus sitting for an hour, we can start seeing the potential health um, uh, health risks that are associated with this. So looking at sedentary, sedentary behavior and obesity, um, increases in sedentary activity, there, it's associated with all these increased risks in <clears throat> diabetes, cardiovascular disease, various cancers, all-cause mortality. And really, as I was discussing this slide with uh, some friends um, at the gym, you know, the science on sedentary behavior and sitting was pretty definitive, you know, I'd say, back in 2011, 2012, and since then, over the past, you know, six to eight years, the message is, has been the same. No matter which kind of risk group you might be in, it could be uh, pregnant Latino women who live in a certain part of the country, or you could have um, you know, elderly African Americans with, you know, prostate cancer, all these specific demographics, the story is the same. When we start moving more, we get better health benefits. So, these are just the general risks, sedentary behaviors associated with diabetes, CV, cardiovascular disease, all these things. But in general, it affects all the sub, you know, uh, demographics. So uh, when we're looking at sedentary behavior, looking at it from the behavioral lens, the exercise folks have it figured out. Sedentary behavior is any waking activity characterized by energy expenditure, just think of calories here of less than or equal to 1.5 metabolic equivalents and a sitting or reclining posture. So you're basically uh, sitting down or lying on the couch. So just think about it there. Now, a, a key component here that's different about sedentary activity is that it's different from everything else that we do. So we have sedentary behavior or sitting as only one part of the day. So now we have a, a pie chart, and let's assume that you uh, all everybody sleeps for eight hours. So we have 16 waking hours. We know that 70% of our time will be sitting. Another, um, what do we have here? Another 25, 26% will be the light intensity activity. So that's just house chores. That's doing the laundry. That's coming and going in the kitchen. That's um, going to the mailbox. All those light activities. And then we have a small section, a small sliver of the day of just 30 minutes. You know, 4% of our time is spent in this moderate, vigorous physical activity, those activities that elevate our heart rate. So again, so we're looking at the pie chart. That's just 4% of an entire 100% pie is dedicated to uh, activities that raise our, 
our heart rate. And so the big take home here is that sedentary time, that time outside of exercise time, there, that, that, um, that needs to be looked at, right? There's a lot of effects associated with too much sitting. So what's the problem with sitting? I kind of alluded to it. It goes against everything that we are built to do. Our body is built for movement. And working off of that pie chart, we're spending 70% of our day sitting. The body is not going to respond well. So on a typical day, um, these graphics here, we might be we might be commuting. This is just uh, Frank Griffin, cartoon slides from Family Guy. He's driving, then he's at work, he's painting his fingernails at, at the computer. Then he goes out to uh, he goes out to lunch with Quagmire, sitting. He might get some physical activity, he gets into a fight with the, the crazy chicken. And then he goes out with friends, have a couple of drinks, have some dinner. And then he goes home and engages in some sedentary reinforcers, i.e. watching TV. And then that cycle repeats. And this is probably the, the typical uh, behave, physical activity pattern that sedentary behavior pattern that most Americans are engaging in most of the day. So you just repeat that. Um, you know, we have social commentary of movies here. This is a slide of Wally. -E. Um, the movie Wally -E has a, it's a, you know, it's a movie about uh, how humans have really just automated their entire world. And there's a picture of overweight cartoon people, and they're watching pretty much transparent iPads, sucking down Slurpees, and then the Wally, -E, the Wally -E character is looking at them like. Oh no, what's happening, right? And so they're just kind of going down this conveyor belt and this is like what's what's happening in the world, right? And then, um, you know, it's really, this is, this is a, a commentary on how our sedentary behavior sitting is kind of like sneaking into our, our arts and culture. And so we have a movie like that. Um, we have the, probably one of the greatest TV shows ever in which people are, you know, really fighting and arguing for this, the power of the chair, Um the series just wrapped up, but there's a lot of family drama, a lot of fighting, there's a lot of wars, there's some dragons involved. What show am I talking about? Game of Thrones, right? Game of Thrones, I love the show. Shout out to everybody who read the books. A lot of opportunities to, to change change the storyline if uh, if George R. 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 Martin writes the final books, puts them out there. But uh, again, there's so much power, so much cultural ramifications that comes with really just having the ability to sit down. So... I just like to throw that piece in there because not only is it about physical activity and movement and searching for food, but really that cultural piece is going to shape a lot of what we do day in um, and day out. And here's just a quote that I got from a book that was all about chairs and chair design. Is that um, from William Stumpf, who is a office chair designer? He says, "Quote: You shouldn't sit in e you shouldn't sit in even the best designed chair for more than thirty or forty minutes at a stretch." meaning that we're not supposed to spend all day sitting down, right? So there's a lot of uh, ill health effects um, associated with sitting. And this is where we'll, where I will jump into kind of uh, this nice chart here. So you might be thinking, well, Nick, I, I exercise. That's, that's good enough, right? Well, here's kind of the major, the major case here, is that you actually have to do a lot of exercise to protect against regular sitting. So this is where it might be hard to... Um, understand over the podcast, so go ahead and check it out on a slide of the video here. But what I'm going to show is a set of set of graphs, one graph as I move forward here. So this is a three-dimensional graph, and the y-axis is uh, risk of death. So what happens is anytime we have very large risk factors, the cylinders, the data points are going to be super high. So we want low data points is better for associated risks. Okay, so that's the y-axis. On the primary x-axis, we have the amount of sitting time, and that's kind of bucketed into how much sitting you do per day. Is it 0 to 4 hours, 4 to 8 hours per day, 8 to 11 hours, or greater than 11 hours a day? So just think about your day job, what you do on the daily basis, how much sitting time do you have? And now there is a z-axis that kind of goes away from the screen, and that's your minutes of physical activity each week. And it's either 300 minutes, 150 to 300 one to 150 or zero minutes so now you bring all these combinations together so if you are sitting less than four hours a day and you exercise for 300 minutes you're at a lower risk than somebody that has zero minutes of exercise and sits for less than four hours a day so then going backwards um, so the, the kind of the depth of the graph you have a zero to four 
that's the lowest bar and then if you exercise less the next risk is higher and then if you exercise less than that it's higher and so on and so forth so this is very hard to describe over podcast so i encourage you to look at the video so um what happens is, is once you increase the sitting time from zero to four to four to eight that the, the height those relationships essentially stay the same so as you increase your sitting time throughout the day so again the worst combination is sitting greater than 11 hours and not exercising at all that is the tallest bar that's the worst risk factor now the best risk factor is the shortest bar which is exercising the most and sitting the least and so in between you have 16 different combinations of sitting time and exercise time but in general because we have this relationship it's as total sitting time increases the risk of death increases so regardless of your physical activity level so that's the key here so you have your sedentary time and your exercise time all working as as they relate to different risk factors so now if you're listening you think about which category you're in do you want to move more do you want to sit less do you want to change categories so you probably want to be in the you know the middle of the road categories right when it comes to these risk factors and again just the caveat is that this is just you know two variables that are associated with risk you could hypothetically sit sit a lot not exercise and you never develop heart disease you could exercise a lot and sit very little and you could develop cancer again these are just data as they relate to large populations and what happens to most people most of the time with these combinations so from the research the main point here is is that even if you exercise meet those guidelines the 150 minutes of exercise per week the 10,000 steps per day your risk of various diseases and cancers increase so that more you sit the greater your risk for these diseases even if you exercise so you need a lot of exercise to kind of combat those those risk factors so what do we do from here so you can improve your health by one of two areas you can increase your total sitting time or sorry that's the wrong thing to do you can increase your total exercise time or you can reduce your daily sitting time because each of those will, will reduce those risk factors so the experts got together the researchers said okay well, what do we do we need to decrease that volume reduce that sitting time by two hours each day and then we need to work up to four hours they don't have specific research to back that up but I think that's a general guideline that we all can agree with so reduce your total volume that sitting time that two hours per day and then you need to move every 30 minutes so that's where that um, that uh, those timers come in and that's where the standing discs come in that's why they're so popular so I'm if you if you're watching the video now I'm at a standing desk so I'm reducing some of my sitting volume um, today and when it comes down to that that uh, that moving every 30 minutes well you need to ask well how much movement do we need and the answer is not much movement at all it's just really light walking standing up and stretching every 20 to 30 minutes because it comes with so many benefits and here I'm just going to list a couple of those those benefits now our metabolism uh, metabolism improves right I'm not a I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian or internal medicine doctor but just generally after eating those that move more have improved blood sugar levels better insulin levels versus those who do not move or walk within 30 minutes have poor poorer blood reading so think about kind of that grandma's rule of you need to go walk off your dinner right um, that's kind of the application there and just the, the the general the general idea is that your body does not need to mobilize or break down you know your your your, your carbohydrates and fats because your body is in is inactive and it goes into fat storage mode whereas if you're walking around your body's using that right um, that's that's uh, one of the main benefits of regular movement um, the the next one is that you're gonna have more muscle engagement so I got an image here of uh, you know a, a, a 3d picture of a, of a of a muscle of a full body muscle and the buttocks are highlighted red so your muscles are used and get stronger so it's true if you don't use it you lose it so you more muscle engagement if you're standing up you're using your quads using your glutes using your hamstrings um, muscles getting stronger uh, you also have improved circulation so you get better digestion just like i said digestion with your blood flow in your in your gut and then your legs don't fall asleep so anytime we are you know sitting in a chair um, the chair isn't designed great you're pinching your legs you're starting to get you know you, your legs start to get swollen right well we've all heard about that where 
uh, diabetes patients, their legs get get swollen uh, from uh, from just the way gravity pulls you know things in uh, you know blood into their legs. Circulation isn't great. Um, also, think about our improved breathing patterns. So when we're hunched down all day, our diaphragm is a muscle and it can't expand and contract in the same amount of space. And so if we're standing up, we can take deeper breaths. We can we don't have shortness of breath and we have better breathing we have improved blood flow so the general idea here is that you get more oxygen to your brain you're more alert at work you have you can you can think better on your feet that's the general um, idea there so standing up and moving your diaphragm can bring more oxygen to the brain and probably one of the most common issues with sitting that we hear about again getting back to the that S spine curve our spine is the designed for upright movement and walking when we're hunched over all the time, we get all kinds of pressure on our back. So we can relieve lower back pain when we're up and moving, we find ourselves in better positions, so on and so forth. So just being upright moving can be beneficial to reducing uh, back pain. So here's just a couple strategies now to just think about. Again, this is part one of a two-part um, uh, podcast. So thinking about how to improve our impor- performance outside of the box you know, we spend a lot of time working in this knowledge work, this computer age. So when you walk into a space, you'll be working for more than the next two to four hours. Just think about how your office, how your office is arranged. Um, do you have, you know, can you go stand at some type of a bar height table and do a little bit of work there? What tasks are there? How long are you going to be there at each task, right? Some tasks you need to be uninterrupted for a while. That's okay. But just think about, okay, if I do a a long, heavy, concentrated task. Maybe I need to do a couple 20-minute ones here, 20-minute ones there. That's what I like to do, you know, to mix up my day. If I have a long computer session where I got have to crunch a lot of data, make some presentations, I'll do that for two hours. Then I'll go find somebody in the office, catch up with them for 20 minutes, you know, maybe go back to my desk, have a meeting, mix it up, mix and vary throughout the day. Step two, this gets in more to kind of the antecedent side of things. Um, we want to trigger more movement. So We want to trigger, um, give us the opportunity to, you know, go ahead and remember to move, right? We get caught up in our work. Got to set those timers every 25 to 30 minutes. I have an Apple Watch. has a great feature, easy. You can put a shortcut on there uh, to go off. I usually do every, like, 40 minutes. That seems to work for me. But every 25 to 30, some some type of movement is good. Um, You could remove trash cans and office supplies from your desk. Instead of having everything, instead of having the the supply closet, Underneath your desk, how about you go walk to the supply closet, right? How about you go walk to the trash can that's in the kitchen? You could also purchase a purchase or make your own standing desk. You can put cardboard boxes um, under under your uh, under your monitor. You can set things up there, and I have a whole infographic you can look on my website of how to set up your desk right. Um, you could regularly drink water, so if you have to, if you drink more water, you're going to need to go to the bathroom more often, right? So we're going to trigger more movement that way by meeting our biological needs um, you could park far away in a parking lot that's what i do um, you're not going to be walking too much in the office anyway so that's one sneaky way to get in some extra steps um, before you know it you could rearrange your work tasks like i just said and the last uh, strategy for triggering more movement is that we can advocate for policy policy change you know within the, within our industry within our organization we could um, you know, maybe we could get some type of stipend to get multiple employees standing desks. We could have walking meetings. We could do all kinds of things. So there's a lot. You know, it's kind of a, a global, you know, approach to how to get more movement outside of outside of the gym. And one piece here, um, uh, when we're thinking about movement, it's all about the quality of movement, how well we are are feeling on the day to day, especially when it comes to mobility. So. Um, Fortunately, there's one great benefit of CrossFit. Most programs have a, a mobility, loosening, stretching kind of section. And so specifically as it relates to sedentary behavior and sitting, we want to target our hips and shoulders. And so really the goal is to undo all the time that we spend in this kind of poor hunched over position in which our shoulders are rounded, our hips are tight, we're hunched over, right? So we have a picture here of a gentleman who is hunched over at a table, you know, Working on his iPad, that's kind of like what the what the standard is for most people today. Um, but on the bottom here, I have uh, just a picture of just the schedule of the uh, the workout and the stretching mobility exercises that I had 
for my gym over the past week, and we all know the yoga poses. We have uh, mobility, we have the puppy dog, we have the hip function, um, all those exercises. We have uh, PVC pipes, so those, so those white plastic kind of construction material PVC pipes. That's what's used oftentimes in the gym to warm up the shoulders. We can do some overhead squats with those. We can um, do pass-throughs we, where we hold the bar um, above our head and bring it behind our behind our back. We do those, loosen up the shoulders. So all these activities are great for mobility because of all those short-term effects, you know, short and long-term effects that comes with a lot of sitting time. So in the pictures here, we have a guy in a kind of a low squat and a kind of a elbows on the inside of his knees, um, position, loosen up his hips. There's a young lady who has her hip on the side of a, a plyometric box, leaning forward, her hips um, uh, in that position. There's a there's a gentleman in the uh, lower uh, lower right where he's got his he's grabbing his wrist behind his neck or behind his back, and then he's um, he's tilting his his neck to the left and right. And then we have Dominique Mucciano. She's stuck. She's a gymnast. She's stuck the landing. She's putting her 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 arms in the air and she's showing us her armpits. And so that's a good way to kind of unscrew the shoulders that way and screw them in a in a nice position. So. Um, mobility very important when we're moving more because we have so much time spent in these poor positions so um, just wrapping up here we need to understand that you know fitness is a journey everywhere everybody's journey is going to be unique so getting back to those graphs here you have kind of four different combinations here you could sit a lot and not exercise it's probably the worst combination you could sit a lot and exercise there's some opportunity there you could move a lot move often and not exercise or you could move often and exercise. So that would be kind of the best, that best risk factor combination. So there's a lot of variation in there, right? I just went with those four cut points. But again, you could sit a lot and not exercise. You could sit a lot and exercise. You could move often, but not exercise. Or you could move often and exercise. So again, a lot of opportunity, depending on where you are in your journey, you can do all kinds of things to improve your risk factors. Um, I really just to cl- kind of close the podcast here is that you know, this part one, I'm talking about performance outside the box. I think it's important to look at how our performance doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Everything we do outside of the outside of the gym is going to affect how well we do inside of the gym. So we have, if we spend all day sitting at a chair, commuting, or sitting in a chair, sitting at the office, um, sitting down at home, then when we get to the gym, we got to undo everything and now we need to be in different positions it's going to take a while to see those effects so if we can stay loose and stretch throughout the day that's only going to help us perform in the gym and once we get to the gym we're going to have specific targets and again that will affect how we feel outside the gym so there's a there's a two-way relationship here when it comes to unleashing performance so that's it for part one stay tuned for part two keep moving talk to you soon